is Zara Phillips. Welcome to Arts Up Close. Today I'm at Jinx Proof Tattoo Shop. I've actually been thinking about getting a tattoo, but there seem to be so many choices. Hmm. Oh, these are star signs. You can get one for your star sign, but I actually already have one for my star sign, which I'll tell you about later. Valentine's Day? This one. <laughs> the nurse. That's what I feel like sometimes, a nurse with my children. It's a bit too patriotic for me. <laughs> Hi, we're here with Scott, a tattoo artist. Is that what you call yourself? Uh, a tattooer. How did you get into... Uh... I went to college for graphic design, but uh, I kind of grew up in a tattoo shop. My uh, oh. my brother owned a tattoo shop in California where mm. I grew up, so I always wanted to be a tattooer. But I had a uh, my daughter when I was pretty young, so I stayed in a real career for a while. You know, right. a, little, a little more. Well, this is like stable. quite a career now. Sure, though, sure. Isn't it? Oh, no, I'm I'm super happy. I made yeah. the decision, but when you're a single dad, it's kind of right. tough to take the leap because uh, it was three years of me apprenticing not getting paid right so. right so how long does it take to train as a tattooer um, it all depends on uh, you know nowadays because of the tv shows and everything it's become quite popular so you'll find places that are taking people's money you know mm. they'll take ten thousand dollars or something you know to teach somebody and they right. turn them over real quick really quickly yeah um fortunately in new jersey there's uh, pretty strict you have to do like 2500 hours mm. and Good. Um, the way Ox trains his apprentice, um, it's been almost three years. So. Mm. so tell me, what is the strangest place you've been asked to tattoo somebody? Well, I've tattooed it all. I mean, I've tattooed. I don't know what channel this is on. on camera. Everything. I've tattooed. Yeah. Yeah, I've done it all. But how painful is that? It's pretty painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I lived in London, there was a guy, and I used to see him all the time where I lived, and he was really handsome, young punk. You know, he had all the skinheads in England at the time. He had a spider web, and I just thought it was so sad. Like, his yeah. whole face was a spider web, and he just used to walk around town like this. <laughs> like, he was so tough, and I just thought, what an idiot. <laughs> You've just ruined... Your yeah. lovely face forever. I have to tell you though, like when I first started getting like my neck and hands tattooed like 10 years ago, I was kind of excited thinking that people would kind of leave me alone, you know, like they yes. would think I was tough. All right. Now it's so, everybody has it. Yeah. It's like, it's to the point where you do have to get your face tattooed for people to leave you alone. You yeah. Know? The only place is Disney World. They, they tend, my, my mom, my mom says it's like the Red Sea splitting when I get in the swimming pool at Disney, all the kids go to their parents. <laughs> I'm sitting here with Ox, who is the owner of this tattoo shop. So how long have you had this shop? Uh, the shop's been here since 1990. Mm. Um, I've worked here for about the last 18 years. Okay. And I've owned it for about the last dozen years. I was uh, 15 years old when I started getting tattooed. And um, there was a local guy that used to tattoo like all the like, you know, the local punk rockers and skinheads and all that. And a bunch of us used to go there all the time and, you know, once I came back here from being in Arizona, mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, working a job. I was still living at my parents' house, so I had some money in my pocket. You know what I mean? So it was burning a hole in my pocket, and I always loved tattooing. You but know? who, like, taught you how to tattoo? Because it's not an easy well, like thing I was to saying, learn. Uh, yeah. The guy that I started going to, I started going a weekly Tuesday night appointment at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I was getting a little bit done at a time, however much I could afford that week or whatever. And all my friends used to give him grief, 
hey Jeff, teach me how to tattoo, teach me how to tattoo, and I just kept my mouth shut. I used to draw up a lot of the stuff I would get myself, mm. and you know, you, you have a weekly appointment with somebody or whatever, you start becoming friends, you build a rapport with each other. One day, he just put the machine down while he was tattooing me and said, hey man, you ever think about learning how to tattoo? And I said, no, I never did, but yeah, I'd love to. Mm. And uh, that was it. And that was the beginning. Yep. I, I mean, you I have to have... I continued to work my day job, and then after, you know, after I'd get out of work, I'd go to the tattoo shop and okay. learn what it is to... And did you, tattoo. like, design your own tattoos at that time? Yeah, well, that was one of the reasons <clears throat> why, uh, you know, he saw maybe, I guess, some potential that maybe I didn't know I had or something. Mm -hmm. So... Well, that's how it began. Well, so um, how much are tattoos? Depends on what it is. Really? Everything. It's like everything else in life. You get what you pay for. Right. And, you know, if you go to someone who's reputable, um, if you go to someone who really knows what they're doing, they're going to be compensated accordingly for their time. Right, right. So, you know, I mean, there's sort of an industry standard, what hourly rates are, whatever. So, you know, people, you know, go by that standard. Mm. Um, so, you know, a, a tattoo can range from anybody's minimum charge, which might be like 50 bucks, 75 bucks, 100 bucks, mm -hmm. to thousands of dollars, yeah, depending on uh, where you're going, who you're going to. I was thinking, you know, I'm from England, and in the early 80s, it was coming out that women in England were beginning to get tattoos. Mm -hmm. And that was like unheard of mm -hmm. until that time. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was in America when well, people were starting to get, younger people were starting to get in tattoos. In America, tattooing has really exploded over about the last 12 or so years. Right. Um, where everybody and their mom has a tattoo now. Mm -hmm. um, but in the 80s, like I said, I'm 42 years old. When I was 15 in 1985, there weren't many people getting tattooed. Right. It was still for scumbags and sailors and criminals mm -hmm. and prostitutes and people that were lowbrow, you know, not considered, you know. Right. You know, educated people wouldn't get a tattoo. Uh, people that were respectful of themselves wouldn't get a tattoo. Because you couldn't get a job and exactly. there was all this. So, yeah. you know, when I was 18, I already had both my arms completely done. Mm. And I loved it because people would leave me the hell alone. Because it was scary back then, yeah, right? and they thought I was whatever they wanted to think I was. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I dug it a lot more than I do now because I can't even go to a restaurant without somebody touching my arm. <laughs> you know? What do you think about all these girls? I was talking to Scott about yeah. it. I mean, you see so many young girls now. I mean, they're just covered already at like 20 years of age. Well, I think when you're 20 years of age, you really don't have much living behind you mm. and life experience behind you, and you probably should think about stuff a little bit more. I'm not saying you shouldn't maybe get a tattoo, but some people just get like such crap on them, you know. I have to say at 20 I got a tattoo and it really was stupid. And the guy never said to me, think about it, this is with you for the rest of your life. See, it's a double-edged sword mm. because, uh, uh, you know, my ethics on this are kind of conflicting. Mm. It's a double-edged sword. Uh, on one hand is I have my mortgage to pay. Well, right. And if I don't do it for you, somebody else is going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it's like, you know, my life experience tells me to tell these people that, you know, maybe you shouldn't get your hand tattooed because that's like a really horrible idea when you're 18 years old because you haven't lived your life yet. You're not settled into anything yet and your life is probably going to change over the next 10 years a million different ways. If somebody came in and said to you, someone like me mm -hmm. that walked in, who really does, you know, obviously I have a tattoo, but you wouldn't know that. You know, what? I would what? think you would have a tattoo. You look would like a you? stylish woman. Oh, I like you know, that. You, 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 you seem like you'd probably have one. Yeah, but it's, but that could be just me stereotyping too, like people want to stereotype me. All right. But the thing is, mine was a really silly tattoo. A lot of people have wasn't really silly stylish. tattoos. I have silly tattoos At on 20, me it was like... A tattoo I didn't doesn't have think. to be so serious. Well, that's true. I was saying to my 16-year-old son that I wanted one of those bracelets, and mm -hmm. he said that that was so 1990s. It is kind of a dated look. Um, but at the end of the day, what do people want? People want. I like the way he says it. It is actually I, you know, Tribal but then, tattoos, you know, like the, the dark black, the tribal tattoos. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was very prevalent in the late 80s, early 90s. I couldn't tell you how many tribal bands a week I would do. You know, and it, it was what it was at the time. But it's not like clothes, right? So I can change my fashion. I mean, if you have an outdated you bring the good tattoo. Because... You know, stuff does go out of fashion, and right. you can't get rid of the tattoo. That's perfectly fine. But the reason why that's a good point is because you're talking about clothes, clothes that go out of fashion that you're going to give to Goodwill or the Salvation Army or something mm. in a year or so, or you're not going to wear anymore. But when you go to the store, and I, I want to make this point, 
When you go to the store and you put your $500 worth of clothing on the counter at Macy's, you don't say to the girl behind the counter, instead of giving you $500 for this clothing, how about I give you $420? Or how about I give you $380? Mm. That's one thing I want to educate people on. When you go into a tattoo shop, especially if it's a reputable tattoo shop, and you look at the artist's work and you know you're getting something done and you know you're getting good quality fair work for a good quality fair price, you don't have to feel the need to haggle. Oh, people haggle? Yes. Please don't feel the need to haggle. If oh. you think it's too expensive and you can't afford it, you can go somewhere else, get a different price, whatever, or come back when you can afford it. But it is something that's going to be on you for the rest of your life, so mm. you should think about it. Try to get something that's classic. Some, an icon that's classic that never goes out of style. Mm. You know, there there are things that never go out of style. But isn't placement roses, hearts? Right, I mean, some people yes. think that stuff is hokey. Mm. But you know what? It doesn't ever go out. I of style. I like the rose. Actually, that's what I wanted. Mm. The rose here. I think it's lovely. It that simple rose. That that's right. Absolutely. It's, it holds up over time. It stands mm -hmm. the test of time. You'll always be appreciative of a nice flower tattoo. Mm -hmm. Always be nice and appreciative of a nice rose or. A skull if people so choose or a nice pinup lady mm -hmm. or whatever I mean that, that stuff is iconic it lasts it holds have you had um, a very old person come in who's never had a tattoo I tattooed a 90 something year old woman I believe she was 92 years old oh. and her granddaughter great-granddaughter was one of my regulars is one of my regulars and she brought her in her husband had recently passed and she came in and she got a tattoo and the whole time she was here, she was, whew, I wonder what the ladies at church are going to say. <laughs> and basically, she, essentially, she said her husband was very old school, very mm. traditional man. She waited till he passed to be able to get a tattoo. She wanted one. And where did she get it? She got it on the back of her shoulder. She got a, a butterfly about the size of a quarter. But Aww. for her, it was the biggest deal in the Aww, world. Oh, so. that's really sweet. So we were next... Here to make your dreams come true. I like that. <laughs> What hours do you work? Um, well, we're open seven days a week. Mm -hmm. uh, we're here Monday through Saturday from 1 to 9 p.m. or until we're done doing what we have to do that day. And on Sundays from 12 to 8 or until we're done doing what we have to do mm -hmm. that day. And do people have to book appointments? Can they walk in? We take appointments as well as walk-ins. Mm -hmm. um, myself personally, I always feel that I'm usually busier on a Friday and a Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I tend not to actually take appointments because yeah. there's more of a walk-in trade. Okay. So I keep myself uh, clear to take people as they come, first come, first serve. And what would you suggest to people that really are thinking about getting a tattoo? If they were walking in, what would well, they need to be prepared for? I mean, if you're really trying to get something that's deep and meaningful, maybe do your research, figure it out, you know, before you come in here, maybe bring some reference if there's things in particular you want to incorporate with your tattoo, the more reference you could bring us, because we're not mind readers, you mm -hmm. can tell us what you want, but you know, at the end of the day, it's our interpretation of what you're trying to uh, convey to us. So I mean, if you have certain things that you want to include, maybe you saw something in a book, a magazine, in the newspaper, on Google. You can always uh, feel free to bring that stuff in, so if we get a better idea of what you're going for, the best we can tailor the design to what you want it to be. Mm. We can draw you anything you want. If you want us just to think of something, give us an idea and we'll think of it and give you our rendition of it, that's cool too. No one can understand the life of a woman in the developing world better than another woman in any part of the world. The struggle to be equal and to be allowed to realize your potential. At CARE, we found that when women are empowered, it's one of the fastest ways to help the world move forward. If you'll just reach out and lend a hand, you won't believe what you can start. Visit care.org. Hi, my name is Zara Phillips. Welcome to TV34 Arts Up Close. And today my guest is Jenny Milchman, author of Cover of Snow. And I'm very excited to talk to you about your debut novel. Thank you, Zara. And it came out when? It came out yesterday. Wow. <laughs> so tell me about you and how you came to write this book and the events that led up to it. Well. I mean, here we are in Montclair, and I started writing in Montclair, I would say, when I was five years old. I have a memory of my kindergarten teacher binding my first book. So we can't call this my first book. This is my own. Um, you know, I wrote all my life, and I always wanted to write. And 
uh, when I was a sophomore in college, my parents kind of sat me down and asked how this whole writing thing was going to lend know. itself to a living. <laughs> yeah. And I talked to them about living in the woods and having a log cabin and writing poetry. Um, and they said, mm -hmm, plan B. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to school, graduate school for psychology and I almost completed my dissertation, but I always wanted to write. That's and very different, being a psychologist than being a writer, yeah. is it? I think in some ways it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think my fiction is a little, is very psychological probably. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when you're practicing psychology, you're talking to people about their stories. And when you're writing, you're creating the story. Right. So did you get, I mean, obviously you have insight from your patients. Did any of that feed into your writing, do you think? Or I think your characters? It did. I think it did. And I remember working at Newton Memorial Hospital way back in the beginning and having this very intense kind of case. And I know that's what made me finally sit down and write a thriller, you know, it was almost, my life was almost a thriller. I was involved with these people who could have been characters in a thriller. And that novel never got published, which is a good thing because it was probably too autobiographical. Right. But um, yeah, I think that definitely one fed into the other. So I was reading you'd written short stories before right. you got to this right. place. So after writing a short story to embark on a novel, I mean, it's a lot more work writing a novel. Did you get, I mean, where did you get your inspiration for your novel? You know, so this novel is called Cover of Snow, and it came to me just a very throat-grabbing question. What would make a good man do the worst thing he possibly could to his wife? Mm -hmm. And as soon as I had that question, I knew I had to write a novel about it. I wasn't even sure what the worst thing would be, but I had to write to find out. And um, Well, I mean, in the book, there is suicide, Yeah. Um, which is a probably one of the worst things in, that you can do yeah. to a family member anyway. Yeah. Um, did you have an experience with suicide, personal experience? You know, I, di I didn't personally have an experience with suicide, and for the longest time I felt as if this novel was really just full-blown um, fiction, you know, nothing connected to my life. And then when I was talking to somebody about this recently, I remembered something that happened to me when I was eight years old, which was that I had a babysitter one night, and he came into my room, you know, late at night and kind of sat down on the bed and said that he was going to kill himself that night and mm. told me not to tell anybody. And it was very, uh, you know, I was only eight. It was a big responsibility to hand an eight-year-old. I had no idea what to do. And I sort of rolled around in the, you know, blankets and tossed and turned. And my parents got home and my mom came up to check on me. And I don't even remember consciously making the decision, but I, I told her. And she, I just remember she turned and walked out of my room very quickly. Mm -hmm. And when she came back, she told me that she had called his mother and that his mother had gone into his room and found him with a bottle of pills. Oh but he ended up being all right. So, you know, well, did I would that, think that's pretty yeah, impactful. Yeah. I mean, things like that you don't forget right. at that age. Exactly. And um, with your clients, you know, as a psychotherapist, did you um, have any cases where they've been involved with suicide? You know, it's yeah. just it's kind of an interesting topic. Yeah. to talk about. Yeah, and an important one because mm. I think one of the things with suicide is that people don't talk about right. it. Um, I did. I started out working in psychiatric emergency services. So right. what we did was the people who were at the most desperate times would call us and need help. So yeah, suicide definitely came into play. So um, how long did it take you to write the book? And you know, tell us also about the publishing, your experience with publishing. Writing the book, not such a long time. I really love to write. It's mm -hmm. fun. I, I, you know, I, I feel lucky to get to do it every day. Publishing is a whole other ball of wax. You I know? mean, did you write before with your short stories? Were they published? M many of my short stories were. And short stories, I think, are easier. I have a short story published in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, which is a wonderful, wonderful resource for short story writers. You know, writing novels and trying to break into, yeah. especially with a big it's house, yeah. I mean, very difficult. And it took me a long time. Cover of Snow is my first novel. It's my debut novel, but it's the eighth novel I've written because right. it took me such a long time right. to find the right editor. And but agent. did you, when you were writing the book, did you have a publisher or you yeah. just wrote the book? I just wrote yeah. and wrote and wrote and wrote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't. It took me a long time. I always had great agents who were working with me. But um, no, I didn't have a publisher for that. And we, you know, you asked about the publishing world mm -hmm. and how it's changed, mm -hmm. and there's self-publishing and all different right. you know roads today. And we came very close to doing something like that because for a long time it seemed as if Cover of Snow wasn't gonna find a home. So. Mm -hmm.
But it has. But it has. And tell them who you're published with. <laughs> with Random House. Which so is a big publisher, up, so yes. congratulations Thank with that. You. So Thank we were talking before about young children and everything, <laughs> and you were telling me you're going to go on the road with your two kids. We are. On a book tour. On the book tour. Um, we are car schooling the kids. Car schooling. Because <laughs> there's no <laughs> home mean? to do it in, right? It's, we're coining a whole new term. Um, yeah, we're hitting the road. You know, I feel as if today a lot of people, a lot takes place virtually. And it's mm. great. I would never have met you if right. we had not had this wonderful virtual world and mm -hmm. Facebook and Twitter. But I also feel like there's something in the conversation and the face to face. Oh, absolutely. And that's what the tour is about. Yeah. We're going to go out there and meet people and shake hands and see the booksellers who uh, all reports to the contrary really do have a lively, thriving kind of scene mm -hmm. out there yeah. in different states. And we'll be on the road for six months with the kids. That's, uh, that's going to be wonderful. You'll have to tell us about it when you come back. I um, would love to. But I think you're right. I mean, the thing is there's so much, people spend so much time on the internet, and Facebook, all the rest of it, but we still want to hear person to person and have conversations and I think with a book like yours going into bookshops and maybe people that are, are touched by this story yeah. you know um, will come in and maybe open up about themselves I mean you just never That'd know where wonderful. it's going to lead right so yeah that would be wonderful and how are your kids are they excited they are excited yeah yeah they get to miss school they get to miss school <laughs> although oh, they go to luck. a wonderful school I have to say and, yeah and, and you know we are sorry to be taking them out, but they are very excited. When are you leaving? We'll leave February 1st. We head down to uh, Pennsylvania and then North Carolina and then back up to Virginia because you can't always lay it out in a linear right, route. And yeah. then Mississippi and up to Colorado and out west. That sounds really like it's going to yeah. be amazing. And I mean, I like all the small bookshops too. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's Barnes & Noble and all the rest of it, which is great, but the little bookshops. Right. You know, you can do book signings and the people that you draw to that. Yeah. I think yeah. It's, you'll probably write another book from your <laughs> tour. You'll be inspired. But I do suspense, so it'd have to be mayhem on the road, yes. and we're hoping for no mayhem. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that the tour could be a, a story. If, if somebody like you, you've written on fiction, would want to write it, I'd be very happy. Yeah, you have to give me notes later. Yes. I'm just yeah. I, I just think it'd be funny, the car schooling, <laughs> not the homeschooling, right. the car schooling. Absolutely. That's like a whole story in itself. Right. <laughs> Are you doing your times yeah. table, kids? You'd just be singing all the way. You could <laughs> sing like the, the uh, yeah. sing your times table Absolutely. all the way. It's a way to music. learn, right? Yeah. Um, so you were telling me as well, you finished your second book. Is yeah. this a follow-up to this book or something completely different? Well, so the town in Cover of Snow is called Weedskill. Mm -hmm. It's a fictional Adirondack town. Mm -hmm. And my next book takes place in Weedskill, but with all different characters. So mm -hmm. hopefully you see the town through the prism of different people's eyes. Right. That's so it. it's different. So the, the characters, it's not connected with no. this last book. No. Although there's one who comes on, plays a little role. But mm -hmm. Interesting. And it, is this town real? It's not real. It's, it's completely real. made up. Yeah. Interesting. And you finished that book already? I did. I did just wow. finish it, yeah. She's fast. She's a fast writer. <laughs> See, the writing is the fun part. The it was writing. the publishing that slowed me down. And, and it's yeah. been 13 years, actually, as we sit here talking. Mm -hmm. I mean, this kind of moment is really, took me 13 years to get here. So. Yeah. No, I know. It does take a very long, people don't realize that. Yeah. You know, when you get a book, you're like, oh, I'm signed with Random House. People right. think it's like the first time that you right. send your novel out. Right. It's not the way it works. No. No. But, and you're finding that they're being supportive and helping yeah. you get the book out there. Uh, yeah. They've been wonderful. They hosted this bookseller's dinner. That was the neatest thing a couple, last week. 30 booksellers came mm. out to my hometown, my now hometown. Montclair is where I was born, but mm -hmm. out in western New Jersey and hosted this dinner that was all sponsored by Random House. They've been wonderful. Oh, that's really great. Yeah. And then there was something else you were saying. You are doing an event uh, this evening this and you are involved in um, Book Day or... Yeah, it's yes. called Writing Matters is the series right. at Watch Young Booksellers. So Watch Young Booksellers is, you know, you know, at the, yeah. the local bookstore here in Montclair. And it's just the most wonder... It's a book lover's bookstore. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's, it is. you know, it's cozy and the titles span, you know, clearly reflect the booksellers' loves and mm -hmm. passions. And Writing Matters is a series that's been going for almost four years now. And we talk about publishing and writing from all different perspectives. And so tonight, my editor and agent are, uh, again, heading out out to the wilds of New Jersey from New York and we'll all be talking about 
how you get a book out with a big six publishing house today. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And uh, what was the thing you, we were talking about? You do something with children? Oh, take your child to take bookstore day. Take your child day. to the bookstore day. Yeah. So the first Saturday of December each year is take your child to a bookstore day. And it started out small, you know. We just sort of talked about it online again. Mm -hmm. And 80 bookstores celebrated back in 2010. But this past year, it was well over 500 bookstores in all 50 states. Wow, so, fantastic. Yeah. So you're pretty immersed in the whole I love bookstores. writing world. I yeah, and I just love bookstores. Yeah. I really do. Me too. In fact, yeah. that Wachung Booksellers, yeah. that was the first, I was sort of dropped in this town when I moved here. Right. And I got off the train and I saw that bookshop oh, and I yeah. went straight in there. Oh, that's so and interesting. I, I, it's, it really is such a beautiful shop. Yeah. So what kind of books do you like to read? I always find this such a hard question yeah. because I'm All worried books. I'm going to leave somebody. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm also going to worry. I'm worried I'll leave somebody out. But I mean, I really feel like I read and I write crime fiction because, you know, we live in a world today that I, I, I keep going to this and I keep saying this, and you know, it's the one month and one day anniversary of just a terrible, terrible event in our country, and we live in a very disordered world, and I think that we have to all cope with that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I read crime fiction, and I write crime fiction because I feel like it orders some of that. And you know, there, I write toward a sense of redemption at the end, and the authors I like all, I think, have that sense of redemption in their books. So I'm a huge Lee Child fan. Some people might have seen Jack Reacher this uh, season mm -hmm. out with Tom Cruise. You know, not the kind of book I write at all, but if you want justice, you know, go to Reacher. And Lee Child is just a master at, at creating a just universe. Um, and they say, you know, write what you know. Right. And what I find interesting talking to you is you started to be a psychotherapist right. or psychoanalyst. Right. So that's really about finding out about people. Yeah. So now you're writing books, which it is. At yeah. first I was like, oh, it's so different, but actually it really isn't. Right. But I wonder if on a personal level is if that's how you are personally you know when you make decisions in your relationships mm. with other people um, if that comes into play as well if it comes down to psychological analysis and that yeah. kind of thing yeah I think it probably does I think that's how yeah probably how I see people in the world yeah. So we'll have to watch So that. right now I'm analyzing she's like, you. Yeah, <laughs> she's sitting in a weird way across <laughs> her leg the other way. <laughs> so writing, as I know too, takes a lot of discipline. And when you have children, and we both have young children, it is hard finding that time. I know for myself I'm very good at tuning. They can be screaming and I can zone them out mm. quite happily and, you know, do that. I mean, obviously it's better when it's quiet. How do you find the time and how do you discipline yourself? You know, what advice would you give people? So, I mean, not to do it my way probably. You know, I started out um, and I wrote from 4.30 in the morning until 7.30 when I had to get up and leave for work. That was very hard. I don't think you can do that forever. You know, certainly, you know, when my kids were both in preschool and I had a two and a half hour chunk, I wrote in that two and a half hour chunk. And when they both went off to school full time, it of course got much easier. But to distill that into advice for people, I would say write when you have the time. Yeah. And if that time is at a crazy hour, but you can, you know, if you want to do this and if this is inside you, you will do it. Yeah. Nothing will stop you. And there's a great quote that says, if you can not write, don't exactly. because and if you can't right. you have to if you have I to. know for me you know I'll be at home and it'll be there's a bad you know basket of laundry right. the house is a tip right but I have time to write right. so Tune I'm just out. like don't even look at the mess right go right yes deal with the mess later yeah. because you literally have to train yourself to do that right um, and somebody also recommended write on a calendar like a work uh, schedule. Commit to your schedule. Commit. Some people do that. And yeah. yeah, I think if people are having trouble sort of prioritizing that, you know, certainly this is important and this is inside you and give it time to come out. And yes, if writing it on a calendar makes it feel like a real obligation or job, by all means, because it is. It's the realest thing there is. Yes. So now you're a full-time writer? I am. I am. How fabulous is that? Yeah. So you have privilege. it like all day. You wake yeah. up like nine to... How long do you write for? Well, I usually write new in the mornings, and I've talked a couple of times about the fact that I write on a machine that's running Windows 98. Mm. There's no internet. I can't get email on it. Mm. I back up on floppy disks. Um, they're becoming very scarce, so if anybody watching has floppy disks, you can send them to Zara and she'll get them to me. Um, 
And then I, in the afternoons, I check email and I go on Facebook and Twitter, and I really try to divide it like that. Because it is, it's the discipline. It's yeah. so easy to stop. Oh, oh, absolutely. I'll just check in here. It's oh, yeah. so distracting. Sure, and then two hours have gone. Yeah. By. yeah. And I think for young people, too, I mean, they're constantly on the internet. I know yeah. my kids are. Yeah. And for them to learn to get quiet. Right, get quiet. It's really, I mean, what I loved, I have to say, during the hurricane. Uh, I mean, obviously, I didn't love the hurricane, but right. that 10 days where we had no power. Yeah, you were forced. I sat with my child every night by candlelight, mm -hmm. and I taught her actually a different chord on the guitar. It was amazing. Yeah. And I did some writing, and I was thinking to myself during that time, I miss, yeah. you know, our childhood would be more like that. Right, well, sure. Where it was quiet. Yeah. And I Unplug miss that. Night. We need that. Yeah, yeah, I think we do. Yeah. So any advice that you'll give young writers? For young writers, what I would really say is just have fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, don't edit yourself. Don't worry if you start a story and it doesn't go anywhere and you want to start something new. Just have fun. Write to the excitement because if you're excited, your readers are going to be excited too. So I just want to thank you so much. Thank you, Zara. And we can find your book now at all bookstores. Yes. Every bookstore, little bookstores, <laughs> big bookstores. <laughs> Absolutely, go into support your local bookstore and have fun when you go there. And yeah, it it should be everywhere. And you'll be on the road, so people from all over um, America Absolutely. can get your book and maybe see you on your travels. They can if they and go to my website. And your we website have a tour date. Is yeah, it's JennyMilchman.com. So Jenny, M I L C H M A N. Uh, yeah, come say hello. Say you saw me on Zara's show. It'll be wonderful. <laughs> and Facebook. I'm sure you're on Facebook yeah, too. Yes, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. A voice will be heard.